not necessarily habits that I need to build, but mindsets that I needed to change that then allowed me to build new habits. One of the things that has surprised me or that maybe it's just been difficult about becoming a parent is how much of it is actually not about the kids. It's about reprogramming yourself. It's like you have this natural response to a certain situation or this certain way that you think about things or this mindset that you get into. And as a parent, you cannot expect that if your weaknesses go unaddressed, that they won't be passed down to your kids. Hey, you guys, and welcome to season two of The Paula Ferris Show. I'm your host, Paula Ferris. So excited to kick off season two with James Clear. But before we dive into this conversation, you guys, I'm going to do one thing better this season. I am going to listen to you. I'm going to listen to the things that you're talking about. And those topics are going to drive the show from here on out. So some weeks I may have a big guest. Other weeks, I may just have a really great topic that you want to talk about. So season two, we're dedicating it to a couple of series, the things you're talking about. We'll have a series on parenting. We'll have a series on relationships, a series on work-life balance, all things that you're telling me you're in the thick of and things that you are talking about. So back to James Clear. He is our guest as we kick off season two. And if you don't know James, you guys, he has written like one of the best-selling books of all time. His book, Atomic Habits, was Amazon's number one book in 2023. And by the way, James has so graciously offered to gift three of you with an autographed copy of this book. All the details are in my personal newsletter. If you're not getting it, make sure you go to paulaferrisofficial.com and subscribe. Again, paulaferrisofficial.com and subscribe. I will be giving away three autographed copies of Atomic Habits. So a little forewarning about this conversation, tons of gold in it, like so much. I've listened to it six times already and each time I pick up something new. So take notes whether you take notes on your phone or you're a nerd like me and you actually put pen to paper. But without further ado, here is the one and only James Clear on how to build atomic habits in our kids and how parenting totally rocked his world. Hey there, I'm Maya Shunker, and I'm a scientist who studies human behavior. Many of us have experienced a moment in our lives that changes everything, a moment that instantly divides our life into a before and an after. On my podcast, A Slight Change of Plans, I talk to people about how they've navigated exactly these moments. Because as we all know, the only constant is change. So let's make the most of it. Listen to A Slight Change of Plans on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, James. It's so good to see you again. Hey, great to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Before we actually jump in, we haven't talked. So you and I met at a, at a leadership conference uh, summer of 2023. We briefly mentioned, I briefly mentioned I'm from Michigan. You're from Ohio. You live in Ohio. So I just have to put it right there and just say go blue and then I can move on. Is, is that okay? Are we starting on a bad note? All right, great. Let's do it. Let's get through it so we can move on to the rest of it. Okay. I feel like I do need to confess to you. I have so many bad habits. Like I just texted my husband who is working out right now and I said this can you bring me home a fountain drink? And he said, after my workout at the Y. Uh, (laughs) So that just goes to show you like the dichotomy of my husband and I, I'm like fountain drink, a popcorn, blow pop type of girl. So anyways, James, thanks again for for joining us. And I I wanted like one thing that really stuck out to me about Atomic Habits. And yes, it is a global bestseller, New York Times bestseller. I think you've sold like 15 million copies, which by the way, congratulations. That's pretty incredible. One thing that really stood out to me about your story is your personal story, what happened to you. And I'm going to read Um, It is story time, children. From page six of your book, you said six years after I had been hit in the face with a baseball bat, flown to the hospital and placed in a coma, I was selected as the top male athlete at Denison University, and I was named to the ESPN Academic All-America team. So you're the top male athlete at Denison University. Rewind a couple of years. You didn't even make the varsity team as a junior. So as a junior, you're demoted to JV. You barely touch the field your senior year. So what happened? Like, I, did you start implementing these habits, sleep, study, strength training? Like, what, what happened to do this complete 180? And I think for any parents listening, like who might have a kid that's struggling in sports to see this total 180 is so inspirational. So how did it happen? Yeah, um, there definitely is a stark contrast between my high school athletic career and my college athletic career. 
as you mentioned, I suffered this serious injury my sophomore year of high school where mm-hmm. I was hit in the face with a baseball bat. And the so scary, by the, the way. next nine to 12 months were a long road to get back on track. I, you know, my first physical therapy session, I was practicing basic motor patterns like walking in a straight line. I had double vision for about a month. I couldn't drive a car for nine months. It really wasn't until about 12 months later that I was actually like back on the baseball field. It was a time in my life when I was forced to start small. I I was the kind of, you know, I had some things that I already liked doing. Like I liked sports and I liked school. So that was like an advantage that I had. But all I wanted was to get back to being a normal, young, healthy student and person sure. and um, flip the switch and go back to how I was before. They put me in a medically induced coma that day. And then mm-hmm. I was, I came back, uh, I woke back up the next day. One of the first things I said was I'd never asked for this. And I think initially my response, what I think is pretty natural was like, why did this happen to me? I didn't ask for this. Mm. Just kind of, you know, starting to feel sorry for yourself. And thankfully I had some really positive people around me, my dad and my grandfather in particular, my mom was also crucial in this and getting out of that mindset and starting to focus instead on what's some small thing I can do today. You know, can I have a good session of physical therapy? Can I have a good sure. visit with the doctor? Can I find some small win that I can like latch onto? And once I was able to shift my mindset and start to focus on those little wins each day and accumulate things, um, it put me in a much better position. So to answer your question, over the next five years, I started, it was, you know, the next year was one of the first times that I started going to the gym consistently. At first Mm -hmm. it was pretty modest. It was like two days a week. And then eventually it grew into four or five. I mentioned that I liked school, but I had to get back on track. That was one of the early wins that I felt. I was like, okay, well, I can't really like go anywhere or do anything, but maybe I could, you know, I can study a little bit or I can try to get a good mm-hmm. grade on this test yeah. or something like that. And then eventually that those things started to translate onto the baseball field as well. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, my junior year, I didn't make the team. I was on JV. Uh, my senior year of high school, I barely got to play. Weaseled my way onto a college team, uh, came off the bench my freshman year, started my sophomore year team captain my junior year and then end up being named academic all-american um, my senior year and uh you know I, I don't really think there's anything necessarily heroic or about my is, like athletic it's journey not heroic but it is so unbelievable to barely to, like you said you you barely pitched 11 innings your senior year in high school and then you go on to win this accolade top male athlete at Denison University, like, were you so surprised by these habits and the results that started producing where people are like, what the heck's going on, James? <laughs> yeah, well, I think that kind of speaks to the focus on the process. Uh, pretty much everything yeah. that's written in Atomic Habits is a reminder to myself in some way. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'm a person who is it's easy for me to slide into being very results oriented or goal oriented or focusing mm-hmm. too much on the outcomes or what I want. And so I'm trying to remind myself, you need to focus on the process. You need to return to the system. You need to focus on your daily yes. habits. And so in a sense, yes, it was definitely a surprise that I ended up there, but in another way, I wasn't even really thinking about where I was going to end up. I was just trying to have a good day. Yeah. And I think that's one of the lessons of the book is that all you really need to do is focus on living one good day. And you can even scale it down more than that. You could say, can you just have five good minutes? And you'd be surprised what you can do with five good minutes. Like right. five good minutes of exercise can reset your mood for the day. Five good minutes of conversation can restore a relationship. Five good minutes of writing can make you feel like you're back on track with the manuscript again. It doesn't really take much to feel good about yourself again. Right, and right. I think if you can scale it down and just focus on doing the next action well, you can end up in a pretty solid place in the long run. Yeah, we often bite off more than we can chew. Uh, instead of just focusing on, you talk a lot about 1%. 1% better every day means 37% better at the end of the year. How did you turn your habits and your 180 and your personal story into this global movement of atomic habits, tiny changes, you know, massive results? Like, How did the book come to be? How did you find yourself in this particular space? Well, once I graduated school and my baseball career was done, I was looking for the next thing to do. And um, I went to graduate school and saw a lot of my classmates going and getting normal jobs and getting into corporate America and so on. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really that interested in that. And so I thought, you know, maybe I'll like try to do my own thing. And I kind of fumbled around for like two years and didn't quite know what I was doing. And then eventually about two years into it, I started writing about habits. and. It started out as this Word document that I just, it was just kind of like James's thoughts on habits. And it was just something that I was naturally interested in. I was writing about other topics at the time too. Like I wrote about how to have better squat form in the gym or the medical system in America, things Mm -hmm. like that. 
And when I would publish on those things, the feedback from the audience was kind of like, well, that's nice, but maybe keep it to yourself. You know? <laughs> and when I, when I wrote about habits, that was when I got the best feedback. And people okay. were like, oh, okay. Like, the, yeah, I want to hear more about that. So I just sort of followed my nose there. That was kind of the topic that overlapped with my personal interests and what the audience mm-hmm. was interested in. Mm-hmm. And I kind of had these concerns, it's like imposter syndrome early on, where I was like, you know, who am I to write about these things? I mean, I have a degree in science, I have a degree in biomechanics, but like, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a neuroscientist, don't have any formal training. So, I said that to a friend of mine and he said, you know, the way you become an expert is by writing about it each week. And so I really internalized that idea. And so I wrote a new article every Monday and Thursday and I did that for the first three years. And it was really that writing habit that kind of launched my career and led to the book deal that ultimately became Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. And so it turns out you get two or three years into that process and you've written 100 to 150 articles about habits yeah, like most people have not done that. And so um, you learn a lot along the way and kind of develop your expertise. And I had a lot to say by the time the book deal was signed. Um, And then I spent the next three years writing the book and kind of, you know, collecting all of my best thoughts from what I had previously written. And then uh, in 2018, the book launched. Can we go back to that moment where you just said I had imposter syndrome? Uh, because that's what's so isolating about imposter syndrome or feeling unqualified is we feel like we're the only one. But here you are, uh, you know, uh, have one of the best selling books probably of all time, and you felt unqualified. You you dealt with imposter syndrome. How did you get through that? I think one thing you have to realize, as I mentioned, my my friend gave me that good advice, and I was like, yes. okay, it's really less about how I feel right now and more about can I keep showing up each day and building my expertise. So it's like a little bit. This is actually, it ties in so perfectly with uh, one of the core messages of Atomic Habits. One of the core Mm -hmm. ideas, which you mentioned this concept of getting 1% better each day. The real thing that that's about is emphasizing trajectory rather than position. There's a lot of discussion about position in life. What's the number on the scale? How much Mm -hmm. money's in the bank account? What's your current credential? Do you have the expertise that you need? It's all about like measuring, hey, where am I at right now? And does that measure up? And instead, what I'm encouraging is to say, listen, let's stop worrying so much about measuring our current position and instead focus a little more on our current trajectory. And if you focus on your trajectory, then it's like, well, am I getting 1% better or 1% worse? Mm, Or in the case of writing, instead of worrying about how much expertise I do or don't have, can I just focus on gaining more each week? Can I focus on improving my expertise and knowledge? And if you shift that focus to just trying to get better each day, you can end up in a really amazing place a year or two or three later. And mm-hmm. so that was that was the mindset that I kind of internalized to help me get over that and just yeah. focus on, let me try That's to write good. and learn something new each week. Yeah, it's good. And it's a great encouragement for all of us too. I, I feel like we often are wanting those immediate results instead of just expecting slow growth, small equals strong roots. So uh, thank you for that encouragement. So you sign the deal, the book deal, the book comes out in 2018. Honestly, how many books did you think you were going to sell? Because here we are, 15 million, <laughs> not even six years later, which is mind blowing. Yeah. Well, certainly, I, I don't think it would be reasonable for anybody to expect you know, what actually ended up happening. I had kind of two number, maybe three numbers in mind. So my base case where I was like, okay, I won't feel like this is a failure is if I can sell 5,000 copies in the first year. That was my okay. like, okay, let me try to do that. I think I can do that. Was that what and the I publisher had, was telling you too? Because no, there's like they, your no, the publishers are the very, publisher. <laughs> I, believe me, I tried to ask them about 10 different ways uh-huh. and they would never tell me what they think right. it would sell or should sell or whatever. Okay. So, I don't know. They've, I think they've been burned by that game before, so they try yeah. not to do that. I, so I thought, okay, 5,000 is my base case. I'm pretty sure I can do that because my email list was pretty large by that, by the time the book came out. So then my next, like my stretch goal, my like hope, what I thought I could potentially do if things went well and I worked really hard was, can I sell a hundred thousand copies in the first year? That was like my, you know, like maybe we could do this if we do really do a great job at the launch. And then the little dream that I had in the back of my mind was what if it sold a million copies ever? You know, like, so, I mean, some of this discussion about book sales is like over what timeline, you know, some people talk, they talk about selling a million copies, but I was like, well, what if I gave myself 25 years? You know, like that's now all of a sudden we're talking about a very different number of copies each year. Sure. Like, can you sell 
40,000 copies a year. I don't know. Maybe I can figure out a way to do that. Like mm-hmm. it's, it becomes much more digestible. So I just sort of kind of set my mind to that and started trying to figure out like, what are the ways that I can do this? And I do think I did a, a good job with the launch of the book and getting the word out. I, I would equate launching a book sort of like to launching a rocket. Your job with the marketing and promotion, and all the things you do during book launch is kind of like getting the rocket off the launch pad. Mm-hmm. And if you don't give it enough thrust, then it just kind of crashes back down to earth and the sales sort of drop off after that first sure. you know, week or month. But if you can give it a strong enough push, then it gets to exit velocity and it gets up into orbit and it just kind of stays afloat on its own. And um, I think that's eventually what you end up seeing with Atomic Habits is that I tried to give it a really good push and then word of mouth eventually took over. And now it is sort of, it's a very fortunate position to be in, but it's also sort of strange. I don't really control the sales of the book anymore. I can't like, Mm -hmm. I couldn't really stop it if I wanted to. Now, of course I don't want to, but it is strange to create something and not really be in control of it anymore. The thing Uh that's in control of it is the word of mouth from the readers. Ultimately word of mouth is only going to be driven if people really love what they're, what they're reading or what they're consuming. Um, Mm -hmm. I I always think of Seth Godin's measure for how to drive word of mouth. He says, you have to create something remarkable and that means that it has to be worthy of remark. And that's a, that's a high bar, you know, like what, think about the products that you talk about in your personal (laughs) life. Like what, what are some, what's something that's so good that you've really enjoyed using so much recently that you felt like you had to tell somebody about it or that it came Mm -hmm. up in conversation. Yeah. There probably aren't many products that are like that for you. And just striving to create something that reaches that bar does not guarantee that you will do it. But I think if you don't strive to try to reach that bar, there's almost no chance that you're, you're never going to just like stumble into creating something that exceptional. I think you have to start with that as the objective and realize you may fall short, but it's still worth shooting for. So James, this is where you and I are going to differ because you say that launching a book is like a rocket launch. I say it's like giving birth to a child because, (laughs) and here's why, because you pour so much of yourself, you are growing this baby this this book baby and then you deliver the baby and you love this baby and then you have to hand the baby over to strangers and you don't know if strangers are going to say oh your baby is only worth a two star mm. rating i guess it is out of control it's an out like it's a process you really don't have much control of but you're so vulnerable and putting yourself out there and you're so personally invested in your book baby and then you have no control over how it's going to be perceived and received but Congratulations. Yeah, I had a, uh, I had one author tell me writing a book is kind of like having a baby only bloodier. And <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would admit to that. And guess what? That's a really great transition to talking about parenting and how habits can make us a better parent. And, you know, we're doing a series on parenting and we're, we're eventually going to do a series on, you know, habits and relationships. Um, but some of the struggles that I know personally I have, and I've talked to my audience about what they struggled with, with parenting. I'm just going to list them. Bad parenting habits. We're super distracted. Um, we don't set limits. We don't enforce things. We're not always on the same page. I know personally, I'm not always on the same page as my husband. We give in because it's easier. Uh, we try to be a friend instead of a parent. We're not listening. We do too much for our kids. We criticize. We do things for them because it's easy, not because it's right. So those are a lot of bad habits to to kind of tackle. But what I'd like to do is start off with maybe asking you, what are some of the habits that you have implemented into your your father into your own life to help you make be a better parent? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, certainly many of the things you just mentioned resonated. I think the most immediate things that come to mind are not necessarily habits that I need to build, but mindsets that I need to change that okay. then allowed me to build new habits. One of the things that has surprised me or that maybe has just been difficult about becoming a parent is how much of it is actually not about the kids. It's about reprogramming yourself. It's like you have this natural response to a certain situation or this certain way that you think about things or this mindset that you get into. And as a parent, you cannot expect that if your weaknesses go unaddressed, that they won't be passed down to your kids. Like you not Mm -hmm. only pass down your genes, you also pass down your mindset and your way of being. Makes sense. And so- It's really a lot of self-work to try to change your mindset about things. Like, let me give you one example. You mentioned one of the things that you said was, we do things for them because it's easy, not because it's right. 
I really had to release this notion of there is a right way to play with something. My kids are really young, right? They're, they're like toddlers right now. So I had to like remind myself, it sounds so obvious, but you don't think about it. You see a book or a puzzle or some toy that you give them and you're like, oh, this is how it's supposed to work. Like the rings are supposed to go on this way. Mm -hmm. And you have to realize, no, however they play with it is fine. They're, you don't have to like do it for them to show them the right way to do it. Right. If they're two years old, they can just engage with it and they'll mm -hmm. learn all along the way. And so what I'm getting at is this larger principle of releasing the need for things to go a certain way. And it's like, if you need it to only be one way, then you're being held hostage by the situation and you end up like forcing your kids into that same little box. Um, like it, do it this so way. <laughs> that's one small example. The other thing that, and this, this does lead more to habits that we've built that have been really helpful. You start to realize how much a product of your environment any human is. Mm -hmm. And so if you can prime the environment to make the next action easy, then you put yourself in a much better position. And I think a lot about that. Like, how are we putting the kids in a good position? I don't necessarily need to do it for them, but am I setting them up so that they can figure it out on their own or they can do it well, or they're in a space where even if they fail, it's still pretty safe. Sure. Um, and if you look at kindergarten classrooms and how they're laid out, a lot of them like kind of utilize this environment design principle. So for example, if a kid is in the blue reading group, they might sit in the blue chair or their books go in the blue bin or they have a blue folder. And that cohesion between the environment makes it easy for the kid to know what they're supposed to do. And whenever I came across examples like that, that was one of the examples I came across writing Atomic Habits. I was always surprised how much those principles work for adults too. So like I went to this one CrossFit gym, they had trouble with people putting the weights back and all the gear back at the end of the classes. They would just, it would just be a little sloppy. And so at the end of one day, the owners put everything back where it was supposed to go. And then they took a picture of the wall and they printed it out and they put it on the wall and they said, this is what the wall should look like <laughs> at the end of each class. And all of a sudden the adults were like, oh, okay, I know where to put the box now. And uh -huh, like, it's exactly yeah. like in kindergarten being, yeah. being like, oh, I need to put the toy back in the blue bin, you know? And totally. so all humans respond to their environment like that. And there's so many things that you can do to set the environment up for success. Like another example, a lot of people feel like they watch too much TV or they feel like their kids watch too much TV. You don't want them looking at screens as much. Well, Guilty. if you walk into, Guilty. yeah, so yeah. walk into any living room, where do all the couches and chairs face? You know, it's like, mm. what is this room designed oh, to get wow. you to do? Yeah. And so you like look at the spaces where we're living and working and you're like, well, what are we setting it up for? And I think one interesting thing you can do is just hold a habit in the back of your mind, one that you're, you're trying to build or you're hoping your kids will build. Sure. And then look around the rooms where you spend most of your time each day and ask yourself, what is this space designed to encourage? What is obvious here? What is easy here? And you'll start to notice different things that you can do to maybe make the good habits the path of least resistance and the bad habits less likely. So for example, you walk into the kitchen. What foods are out on the counter? What's most visible? What's most accessible? Is that what you want everybody eating or not? Walk into the living room. Do you see screens as soon as you walk in there? How can you change that? Could you take a chair and turn it away from the TV? Have it so face an end table with a book this on is it. so good. Could yeah. you put a TV behind a wall unit or a cabinet so you're less likely to see it? Is the video game con console like just out and on the floor for everybody to use or is it tucked away in a drawer? And individually, these are very small actions. I'm not going to act like any one of those things will transform your life. But mm -hmm. you can start to imagine collectively if yes. you make a dozen or two dozen or 50 little adjustments like that. Now, all of a sudden, the house and the spaces that you're in each day are optimized for the things you want to do and not the things that you don't want to do. That's so good. Um, it's that 1% rule again, you know, just the little things and then that will have that compound effect over sure. time. Yep. That's so good. What are some of the... Okay, so this is something that I struggle with is being consistent. And I don't know if you have a, a, any sort of uh, habit that could help my husband and I because... One thing you'll notice when your kids are a little older, they try to, it's not that they're trying to pit you against one another, but they'll say, well, they'll come to me. Dad said I could do it. I'm like, okay, but dad didn't say that mm -hmm. they could do it. And so we find that, especially our youngest, I mean, our, we have three kids and like, he's just hanging on for dear life at times, but we're so inconsistent and that's a huge struggle. And then it becomes a huge strain on our marriage too. Do you have any sort of guidance for habits that we, my husband and I can implement 
and I'm not trying to ask you to be a counselor or a therapist. You can say pass sure. if you if you don't have an answer. <laughs> but is there anything that we can do to help us be more consistent as parents and be on the same page? Yeah, you know, um, it's so tough. Like you just so much of your time gets swallowed up as soon as you have kids, especially multiple kids. Mm-hmm. One thing my wife and I have realized is that the only time we actually talk anymore is when we go on a date. Like, and so we've started to like really be like, we need to prioritize doing this yeah. because it's yeah. really the only time that we actually get two or three hours to actually talk to each other. And of course we're talking throughout every day, but it's just that we aren't actually having conversation. We're just like handling logistics basically, you know, and you get to the end of the day and you get the kids down and then you're like, okay, well, it's going to take an hour to like do the dishes and clean the house up and get everything set for tomorrow. And then you sit down and you're like, well, we have like 30 minutes before we're going to go to bed, but we sure. also need to talk about what's going to happen the rest of the week. And you're like, basically all the time gets swallowed up. You don't actually have any time where you sit down and just like chat for an hour. And like and look, think, each other, look each other in the eye. That might and talk like, about oh some my of gosh. those deeper things that are like not <laughs> just like tasky, but like yes. values and connection and meaning and all the things that come up when you have like a real conversation and mm-hmm. not just are like working through a task list. I guess my short answer for that is where's the time coming from? You know, when, when does that time exist? What we found is that it basically only exists if we go on a date. So we're like, well, we need to make sure we do that at least every month, um, hopefully twice a month. But you know, mm-hmm. if we can do one, that's better than nothing. That's one thing that we've kind of stumbled across. The other thing is, I it's been so hard for me to learn this lesson, but I do think it's true. I'm not going to say like, don't be ambitious or give up on your dreams or whatever. But I do think you need to narrow your dreams. So like, it may not be this the season or the time for everything right now. Mm-hmm. And that's really hard for me because I have a lot of things that I want to do. For the first like 18 months to two years of being a parent, I tried to force fit all my old habits into my new lifestyle. And eventually I realized, okay, dummy, like you have like 40% <laughs> of the working hours that you had before. So why do you think you can keep doing the same stuff that you were doing pre-kids? I think the big question is just what season am I in right now and what habits are appropriate or fit best with this season? Mm. And it doesn't mean you can't do the other stuff ever. It just means that maybe now isn't the right time for it. Yeah, and that's good. everybody knows that you only have 24 hours in a day and you have to prioritize and say if no to things or whatever. But I think if you are not feeling like you're sacrificing something by saying no, you're probably not saying no enough. You know, like you need to feel like there's, a, it needs to actually be a little bit painful and you're like, man, I really wish I could do that, That's good. but I have to say no to it so that I can have the space to fully show up in the things that I'm still going to do. That can be tough. That can be a tough lesson to learn and, and a tough thing to practice day in and yeah. day out. What are some habits you're trying to instill in your children right now? Right now it's all the, you know, they're so young. It's all the basic stuff like learning the alphabet and learning how to read and, you know, loving books <laughs> and enjoying spending time together. And there's also just like all kinds of things they learn. Like my daughter just started going to preschool. So it's like, she's learning how to listen to a teacher and how to engage with other classmates, things that like aren't Sweet. explicitly being taught, but are yeah. just good to learn to, you know, uh, good to learn to show up in the world and be, you know, be a functioning member of society. It's all like basic stuff like that. But what I'm thinking more about right now is like, what kind of mindsets do I want to instill in them? How am I, how am I talking about that stuff with them? You know, like when they fall down and scrape their knee, like how do I talk to them about that? So that they like, of course I want them to feel safe and feel like, you know, I'm there for them and I'll take care of them. But I also want to right size that and not make it seem like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that happened. It was such a terrible thing that happened to you. It's like, Uh well, skinning your knee doesn't have to be a terrible thing. You know, like everybody right. skins their knee and like, I, I'm going to be there for, I will always be there for you to comfort you, but also this is a pretty small thing and you can deal with it and like, you're going to be okay. It's, um, it goes, yeah, it goes along with like reprogramming your brain, which you talk a lot about. Like I, I get to cook dinner for my family. I get to wake up. Even the example you gave in your book about the guy that was in the wheelchair who you thought would have a woe is me mindset, but he's like, no, are you kidding me? I get to get in, be in a wheelchair every day and go around and talk to people. And yeah. instead of be, you know, being in my bed, laden in yeah, my bed. People were so. like, do you feel hindered by your, your wheelchair? And he was like, I don't feel hindered by it. I feel um, enabled by it. You know, like it, it allows me to <laughs> engage with the world and move around. And yeah. I love little mindset shifts like that. I have a list mm-hmm. of them that I keep like one that I always think of. So COVID hits, everybody gets locked down. You all, everybody feels kind of like shut up. It's almost like your own little form of a prison. Mm-hmm. You know, you're like, oh, I feel, you know, I feel like a caged animal. And I saw somebody who said, it's not a prison, it's a chrysalis. 
like the, you know, like a uh, cocoon that the uh-huh. butter that a caterpillar goes into and then comes out as this transformation of a butterfly. And I thought, man, That's what so a good. beautiful mindset shift, yeah, you know, like great. instead of being like restricted, like, oh, I can't do anything. It's like, just wait until you see what I transform into out of this period. Yeah. And, That's um, good. I love things that are like that. And, you know, Mm -hmm. there's that other famous one of like, I'm not losing, I'm learning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, little things like that sometimes can sound trite. And it doesn't mean that it feels good to lose or that you're trying to make mistakes, but maybe it gives you a different lens to find the good in the experience and to find the useful part of it and latch onto that. So you launched an app in January. You have a masterclass out, which my husband is obsessed with right now. He's going through it. And one that he's really loving is um, the five to nine habits that help us with the nine to five. Can you tell us a little bit about those habits, which is it's I had to read it twice. I was like, oh, that's so interesting. The habits from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. that can help us, especially as parents, but help us, you know, juggle work life, all of that from nine to five. Yeah. There, I mean, you know, we could come up with an infinite list of these, but I, there are a couple that loom large for me. I think mm-hmm. for me, the probably if I had to pick two or three habits that really set me up to have a good nine to five, to have a good work day the next day, I, I need some kind of movement or activity for, you know, I like lifting weights, but it doesn't have to be that. Like it can be, you know, yoga or kayaking or rock climbing or you pick whatever activity mm-hmm. you want, but you cannot have a human outside of a body. And so it makes sense to take care of the only home that you will ever occupy and that you can never sell. You can't sell it. You can't move on from it, but you can renovate it. You can Mm -hmm. repair it. And so you might as well think about what that looks like. Just as a, a little aside here, which I feel like is very important. When people are choosing new habits, I think it is worth it to ask yourself, what would this look like if it was fun? What would it look like if exercise was fun for me? What would it look like if I had a meditation habit that was enjoyable for me? What would it look like if writing every day was fun? And that doesn't mean that every habit you build will be the most fun thing in your life. You know, it's not going to always feel like a concert or like, you know, going to a, I don't know, show or something, but it does mean that pretty much any habit can be more fun than the default version. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people choose habits that they feel like they should have or that society wants them to have, not because they want to have it. And you, you should choose the version of it that is most exciting to you. So mm-hmm. um, some kind of exercise habit. Uh, the other one that I think is just enormous for me is thinking about the answer to this question. What is the work that keeps working for me once it's done? So oh, that's, that's a good one. When Atomic Habits came out, I did a bunch of interviews, you know, podcasts like this. I did radio interviews, TV, and I don't really do radio interviews anymore. And it's not because I don't like radio. It's just that when I get off air and we just got done with a 10 minute segment, all the work that I just put in has vanished. Now it's no longer being played to anybody. Mm. Whereas a podcast is being recorded and I've done, you know, at this point I've done 200 plus podcast interviews over the last few years. And somewhere somebody is listening to another podcast I did right now. And so in a way it's almost like there's multiple versions of James out there. You know, it's like there, that previous work that I did is still working for me, even though it's done. And not everything in life and in work can be like that. Sometimes things are just, I would equate them to like weeding a garden. Not everybody likes weeding a garden, but sometimes need to do it if you want to have a healthy garden. And there are a lot of things that are like that in life. But if you can find just one or two tasks a day that will keep working for you once they're done, you turn around a year or two or five later and you have this enormous tidal wave of previous effort that is working for you still. Mm. And man, it's just, it's almost impossible to outwork someone who has all that previous work working for them too, because it's compounded and accumulated over time. So I think what I really would call that is it's a habit of reflection. It's a habit of thinking about what is the best place for me to direct my time and attention tomorrow. So that's one of those five to nine habits that I think really pays off in the nine to five. That's awesome. One of the most common questions you're asked is how long does it take for a habit to stick? And you like to reframe it and say how many reps, right? Um, Mm -hmm. How many repetitions are required to make a habit automatic? I've been trying to... I've tried a couple of things that didn't stick and it's because they weren't enjoyable. So I just decided, you know what? I'm trying to force a square peg in a round hole. It wasn't attractive. It just wasn't something I'm not going to try to force it, but I really want to get in the habit of reading every night because I know James, when I read, I sleep better. Um, It just helps me unwind. It's a good habit. I get to actually read books 
consistently <laughs> because as a parent, I'm like, okay, where was I, you know, right. in the book? How can I, and you talk about temptation building can be something like, how could I be consistent? How can I build this habit of reading every single night? Because I know it's good for me and I actually do enjoy it, but I just, I, it's, I, I struggle with getting in the habit yep. of it. I'm really glad you asked this. Cause I, I think this is, it's cr- I wanted to make sure we covered this at some point. So good. I talk about this in atomic habits, but if you want to build a new habit, there are basically four things that you want working for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to make it obvious. So you want that your new habit to be obvious, available, visible, easy to see. The easier it is to get your attention, the more likely you are to act on it. You want to make it attractive. So the more attractive or appealing a habit is, the more motivating or enticing it is, the more you're going to feel compelled to do it. You want to make it easy. The easier, more convenient, frictionless, simple a habit is, Mm -hmm. the more likely it is to be performed. And then you want to make it satisfying. The more satisfying or enjoyable a habit is, the more likely you are to repeat it in the future. So make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. Mm -hmm. I call those the four laws of behavior change. And you don't always have to use all four, but the more that you use them, the more that you have working for you, it's like levers in the right position. And when the levers are in the right position, building good habits is much easier. And when they're in the wrong position, it's much harder. So if you're sitting there and you have this habit, in your case, reading, and you're saying, man, you know, I wish I did this. I just keep procrastinating on it. Or maybe if you're listening to this conversation, you're thinking, you know, I have this habit. I do it every now and then, but I just can't quite seem to be consistent. You can just go through those questions in your mind and ask yourself, how can I make the behavior more obvious? How mm-hmm. can I make it more attractive? How can I make it easier? How can I make it more satisfying? That's and the answers to those questions will reveal different steps that you can take. So sure. in this reading example, make it obvious. All right, well, let's pick out the book that we're going to read ahead of time. And either if it's going to be a physical book, let's set it on the end table, the nightstand right next to the bed. Or in my case, sometimes I say, when you finish making your bed in the morning, set it on top of your pillow. So that you like to get into your bed at night, you have to like pick it up and climb in, you know? (laughs) So um, make it obvious. Second step, make it attractive. Choose if you're just trying to get restarted with a habit, choose whatever the book is that you are most naturally excited to read. Don't mm. sometimes feel, I feel like people choose books because they feel like oh, I'm, I should read that because it'll I be think good that's for my problem. Or something. I think that's my problem. It's pick I'm whatever the wrong have, book. Pick okay. whatever book sounds most appealing to you. It doesn't, you know, don't worry about what other people think or whether it'll get you a result or not. Just whatever you're naturally engaged with. We talked okay. earlier about what would this look like if it was fun? You know, mm-hmm. what book sounds like the most fun to read right now? Third step, make it easy. Give yourself permission to only read one page and that's a success. If you just, so you pick the book up off your pillow, you sit down in your bed, you read one page, done. You're, that's good. And if you don't read any more, that's fine. But you're just trying to make it as easy as possible to feel successful about what you're doing. And if you want to read more then great, make it satisfying. Honestly, if you do those three things, if you pick up the book and you read a page and you've already done, you're probably going to feel pretty satisfied because you're kind of being the type of person that you want to be. But if you want, you can layer on some kind of extra reward to it. You know, like after you finish each chapter, you can take a bite of chocolate or, you know, I don't know, you can come up is with that habit that stacking or no, is that separate? That's, that's, little, more that's like, a little different. Yeah, it's a little bit different. It's um, habit stacking is where you layer multiple habits on top of each other. Yeah. This is more like layering a reward on top of your habits so that uh, you feel, feel Because I do it. habit stack in the morning. I have my coffee and then I um, do my devotional. And after my devotional, I meditate for 60 for 60 seconds. So it's yep. like this triggers this habit, triggers that habit. So that's habit. So this is a reward. What's great about what okay. you do in the morning is that uh, you build up the sense of momentum. Mm-hmm. And so it's just a few small actions, but you've already knocked three things down and you're only like seven minutes into your day and you can start to, you feel good. It gets your day off to a good start. I feel real good. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Yeah. But those are, those are some examples of how you could use the four laws of behavior change to try to promote that habit. That's great because I think where I'm got where I've gone wrong. I read two books that I loved, and um, I picked one this time that I don't love, and I think that's where I've gone mm. wrong. Okay, I got two viewer questions, listener questions, and then we can wrap this up. Dona wants to know: Is there a second book in the works? It's been six years. I know you have this <laughs> master been, class. It has been too you have long. an app. <laughs> um, yes, so uh, I am. I am slowly working on something in the background, uh, a book in the background. Ooh, I'm sure yay. my publisher would love it if it was faster, but that's just where we're at. I don't know. I have saw. You know, your point about books are kind of like uh, delivering babies. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, to what degree my wife would agree with that or not. But uh, I will say 
I've had a book come out and then two years later, later, a baby come out and then two years later, a baby come out. So it's not, it's not that I haven't been launching things. It's just, been, <laughs> they've just been different projects. Um, oh, but uh, yeah, so I am working on that. But Paula, what you mentioned is the the main project I've been working on recently, which is this new habit app. Um, mm-hmm. and it's called Adams, A-T-O-M-S. And it's all about the small changes that make big results in life and shares a lot of insights from the book and things that I've learned since the book has come out. Uh, it helps you track your habits and so on. So you can- That's um, incredible. You can find incredible that work. on the app store and, uh, and at jamesclear.com. A-T-O-M-S, Adams. Um, and last question for you, Sarah says, what's been one of your hardest habits to break? And I can't, without like saying this question, all I can think of is the Chicago song, you're a hard habit to break. Maybe I'm dating <laughs> myself, but- um, <laughs> uh, I have started with so many different ones. Um, one that I really had trouble with for a while. And also while I was writing atomic habits, I was struggling with this. So kind of ironic. I get to like 9 PM and I would catch like a second wind and be like, ah, maybe I'll just check a few emails. And of course it's like never just a few and you turn around and all of a sudden it's midnight and you've been working for three hours. Well, that just sort of wrecks the whole next day. Cause like, well, am I getting totally. up early or not? Or am I going to have less sleep or am I going to sleep in and have less time? And, um, especially once you have kids, you're like, well, I'm definitely not sleeping in. Um, so (laughs) it just just ends up, uh, you know, you end up paying for that choice Mm -hmm. for like three days. Yes. And eventually I was able to fix it in a very strange and surprising way, which was getting a dog. The dog gets up at six and wants to go for a walk. Doesn't really care whether you've slept in or gone to bed late or not. Mm -hmm. And you do that for about three days and you're like, all right, forget it. I'm going to bed at 930. Um, (laughs) So the point that I'm getting at is I knew the strategies, right? Like I I knew how to build better habits. I was writing a book on it. Um, And yet still I struggled with it for multiple years. And eventually I came, stumbled across this solution, the dog in this case, that helped me shift my life enough that I was like, okay, now I have a pattern, new pattern that works. Yep. And all I'm really trying to get across there is that if you try to, to build a habit or to break a habit and it doesn't work for you right away, that's completely normal. And in fact, it might even be likely. Think about what are the odds that the first way you try to do this is the best way or the way that works for you. It's actually, of all the ways you can do it, it's pretty unlikely you choose the mm-hmm. optimal path the first time. So you need a willingness to experiment a willingness to try new things, to see what's going to work for Mm -hmm. you and to keep showing up and trying differently. There's that very common advice of like, try, if something doesn't work, try, try, try again. I think actually it should be, if something doesn't work, try, try, try differently. You should keep trying, but you should try to take different lines of attack, try to take a different approach if the first one doesn't work. And if you have that attitude and you're still attempting to build better habits, I think at some point you're going to come across strategy, strategy that works for you. James, thank you so much for inst- for instilling your wisdom and sharing your personal story. I have tons of respect for you. And um, I can't wait to dig into your masterclass and your new app, Adam. Adams? T-O-O-T-O-M? Yeah. Okay, yeah. awesome. Thank you um, so much. But- Appreciate the opportunity and uh, always a pleasure to talk with you. You guys, look at my notes. I took front and back four pages of notes. A couple of things that I really took away from that conversation, uh, releasing the need for it to go one way with our kids. That was really helpful. Also priming the environment for our kids to succeed and the little mindset shifts that we can start to implement within our kids. Not that I'm losing, but I'm learning. Uh, That was so helpful. And James, if you're listening, thank you for gracing our audience. You guys, James doesn't do many of these interviews, so really thankful to him. And if you haven't picked up a copy of that book, Atomic Habits, you guys, you got to get a copy of it. Again, I'm giving away, or James, I should say, is giving away three autographed copies of the book in my personal newsletter. Again, go to paulaferrisofficial.com to sign up for that. And if you haven't checked out his masterclass, which my husband's obsessed with, or checked out his new app, which is called Adams, A-T-O-M-S, I encourage you to do that. By the way, my DMs are always open. If there's something that you are going through, a topic that you want me to talk about, shoot me a DM on Instagram. That's literally how I've come up with almost all of these conversations so far for season two. Again, we're doing a series on parenting. And next week, we'll be talking with Allison Holker Boss. She is the widow of Stephen Twitch Boss. If you guys remember, he sadly um, took his life about a year and a half ago. Um, Allison is going to talk about how to parent through loss 
and grief, whether that's a loss of a loved one or maybe you're going through a divorce. So a really encouraging and um, inspirational conversation that I'm really looking forward to bringing you next week as we talk about it on season two of the show. Again, you know where to contact me. You guys just DM me on Instagram, rate, review, subscribe, share this. I can't wait to keep the conversation going and I'll see you next week as we talk about it. I know, I know you guys thought you were done with me, but not quite yet. I have one more thing to tell you about. If you're watching on YouTube or you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, don't forget to subscribe to the show. I don't want you to miss a single beat or a single conversation. And remember, my DMs are always open. Tell me what you want to talk about.